Y así pasan los días Y yo desesperando Y tú, tú contestando Quizás, quizás Hi, everyone, and welcome to this live stream Q&A with your favorite cast and crew from the Cuban movie. My name is Olga Consorti, and I'm a lifelong resident of Brantford and super proud to be affiliated with this wonderful film as an associate producer. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hope you like the movie and stay tuned for some wonderful discussion with the cast and crew. My heart goes out to Paul Gallini, my co-host for the night. He had a family emergency. We're all thinking of him and uh, send our thoughts and prayers out to him and his family. And we'll proceed, which is exactly what he wants us to do. So welcome everyone. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to our esteemed director, Sergio Navarata and his family here that's with us today. And Sergio, I'm gonna ask you to introduce the amazing cast and crew that we have here. Sure, first of all, thank you so much uh, to the city of Brantford, to Paris, uh, Brant County, to Olga and all the organizers. Um, you know, organizing something during a pandemic I know is not easy, so thank you so, so much. And I'm really honored um, and, and excited to have my cast here and my team, my producing team. So let me uh, introduce everyone. Uh, so first we have, of course, the living legend and uh, uh, who needs no introduction, uh, Mr. Louis Gossett Jr. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> who joins us from somewhere in the world, some Good. undisclosed place <laughs> from Atlanta. And um, we have the wonderful an incredible actress, Shoray Agdashlu, who uh, who joins us from California. Queen. Yay. <laughs> um, and we have Giacomo Gignotti, uh, who is also uh, joining us from Los Angeles. Yay, Giacomo. <laughs> and the star of the movie and our uh, producing partner, Anna Golia. Yay. And one of those little squares. <laughs> and uh, who else is here? I want to make sure I'm not missing anyone. Taras Colton is here, our uh, producing partner. Ooh, ooh. Happy and birthday, Taras. Happy birthday. His birthday. So ha happy <laughs> birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, yes. I, thank That's you so much, guys. <laughs> 28, and you've accomplished so much. We're so proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, last but not least, uh, the writer of the film, The Cuban, and producer, Alessandro Pichon. Yay! And you're missing someone else. And Luca, and Luca Navarro. Of course. Also <laughs> this little guy. He's the, he's the big boss. The big boss. <laughs> the big boss. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have you here today. Um, Sergio, I know the number one question people tuning in will have is, what was your experience like filming in Brantford in the county of Brant? I know that, uh, they were so excited to host you all here and it was really something special for them. And they want to hear from you specifically what that experience was. Well, without sounding too sappy or sounding like this is a PSA, I want to speak from the heart and tell you that, um, uh, you know, they, they welcomed us with open arms from day one. Of course, that came directly from uh, Olga's uh, excitement and participation in the movie. So that sort of led the way. and. Uh, we were just greeted with such warmth and authenticity, and uh, I think when you're like the first, it's always special. I I'm sure films that will follow us uh, will probably uh, irritate local residents or whatever, as as you know, as it happens. But uh, we had the privilege and honor of of being there and uh, really forging this partnership with the community, and that meant a lot because I think I moved there a month before the shooting. So it became my home, my family's home, and um, and all the cast. And, and we all felt like we were in uh, film camp together. I think, I, you know, I don't want to speak for everyone. I'll, they can speak uh, for themselves in terms of the experience. But I think uh, being away feels like summer camp. So uh, we couldn't be more grateful to everybody involved. And uh, and I think it shows in the movie. There's, a, there's an authenticity and an organic uh, sort of 
sense to the locations and to the people that appear in the background in the nursing home that are real people. Um, so yeah, it was, it was great. Well, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I think we should all sort of toast right now and to the people of Brantford and the County of Brant for being such gracious hosts and welcoming you all. Cheers to everyone. Cheers. And uh, cheers. 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 to Brant and Brantford. And, and to Tross's birthday. And to Tross's <laughs> birthday. Yes, and to Tross's <laughs> birthday. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. And I have to, I have to, That's a I great have, segue. I have to I give a shout that's... out to Paul Golini as well, um, yes. who is very. Um, I think he introduced us to Brantford in the first place. Yeah, yes. Golini introduced us to the Brant Empire communities. And uh, initially, I had to admit, I, I thought the idea was a bit crazy because I didn't know what was there. I knew that Gretzky <laughs> was there, of course. And, uh, you know, I know my dad spent kept... a lot of time there in the labor movement. So uh, great people. But I, I had no idea that we'd find the locations that we were able to find and the great people that were able to support us. So it's wonderful. Well, thanks for having faith in us. We appreciate that. Thank you. So speaking of Taraz, it's kind of a good segue, Mr. Unmute, to talk about what was the inspiration of the movie? Oh my God, the inspiration. Um, that was what, four years ago now, or maybe even more than that. More. Four, four and a half. Wow. Um, but who's Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> the inspiration was my grandfather it's somebody that I looked up to uh my entire life he raised me practically and I missed him dearly and then because of my move from a little town of Russia I moved to Canada and I haven't had a chance to spend much time with him since then uh he passed away unfortunately and it's you know it's it's part of life and I haven't had a chance to say goodbye and then one day I had a dream about him and that sort of inspired me to make something in his honor uh to honor his you know his legacy that he left behind so to speak um and you know the story evolved obviously and it bec became something bigger than what i initially proposed to anna uh who is my business partner and and then we she said hey i i know somebody we can pitch this idea to and then uh, she introduced me to Sergio and then Sergio introduced us to Alessandra and then we all got together over, our, over coffee and then we said, hey, let's go ahead and work, work on this idea. And then it grew into The Cuban um, and now we're here. It's four years later, we made the movie, it played theatrically and it's, it's, I couldn't have imagined for anything to come out of that one little dream that I had one night and and, and we made it into a feature film. It was just absolutely incredible. And it's in a way a little bit insane. It's a, a kid's dream come true because I wanted to be in film since I was a little kid sitting on my grandpa's couch watching movies, uh, you know, and to be in this position today, I'm absolutely blessed and thankful. I couldn't be here in, in, in this position without every single one of you guys uh, on this stream. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. This is an incredible opportunity. I'm, and I, I am in the present of greatness. Thank you so much, guys. I couldn't have done it without you. Well, you're and an inspiration to us. And it's amazing how an idea sort of grows into this wonderful organic thought that has really impacted so many people, particularly with the important themes that are identified through the movie. So Alessandra, as our, as our screenwriter, how do you get an idea and turn it into such eloquent words and such moving passionate script that really has um, been an inspiration to us all. Oh, thank you, Olga. Um, I feel like um, Taras really did a great job of, of sort of illustrating how it snowballed. I mean, it really was just a dream and then a thought and then a communication to Anna and then Anna, you know, sort of in passing mentioned it to Sergio, let's make a short film. And But I think because we were all touched by Alzheimer's and dementia or a special relationship with someone who had passed who was older um, that we didn't get a chance to maybe say goodbye to. Um, it, it had so much meaning for all of us. And so um, when it got to me, it was very, I found it very touching. And, um, and you know, it started as a short film and then it just kept snowballing from there and, and, and became this whole other animal really. Um, 
so um you know it was uh i guess it just came from the heart as much as you know it came from some personal experience from some experiences that people you know i knew had had and uh yeah it was uh it was just it just happened that way well i have to tell you my background of course was in long-term care and hospice care and when I saw the script, I was really moved by the detail and the integrity that you had to make sure that every aspect was covered. And uh, the research you must have done has, was incredible. Uh, so congratulations to you on that, making such an incredible moving script that has really you know, inspired so many people. I did consult, I should mention, I did consult um, you know, some specialists at Baycrest Hospital um, and not just Baycrest, but other um, you know, uh, Alzheimer's specialist that I'd met along the way. I drew on personal experience, like I said, and I also, um, you know, and the research didn't stop. Like I remember being in, uh, at the hospice where we were shooting at St. Joseph's and, um, and there were doctors on set who were kind of guiding us along the way, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> this, this is, this would, this is real. This isn't real. This is how it would work, you know? And there really was, um, we really did try to make it as authentic as possible. So thank you for acknowledging that because I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it translates. Well, you succeeded for sure. There, Luke, there's, a fly, yes? there's a fly buzzing around. So it's karma getting me back for laughing at Mike Pence. <laughs> we can't see he's, he's it. threatening to land on my head. <laughs> You're all good. <laughs> Oh, and Lou, with that, I mean, you must be offered so many incredible roles. What was it that convinced you to take on this amazing role in this beautiful film? These young people have followed me all across America, around Canada, saying that they had something very special. And I believed them after a while. And then they, they, they transfixed me. And the next thing you know, I, I compared that character to Robert De Niro's character in, in, uh, in uh, the film that he did. His ability to go in one take from normal to Alzheimer's and back, I said, I want to see if I can try and do that as an actor. So I was able to do it three or four times in this movie. And it's just it's a thing to do. It's just, he's one of my favorite actors. It's one of my favorite moments in my career to get the opportunity to play stretching this character. A lot of, there's a lot of elders in my family that passed a hundred years old that have a little bit of that. But then it expands the problem of taking care of our elders much better. So it's done more than just playing Alzheimer's. It makes us sensitive to the elder. So it's bigger than it, it really is. A little small, small pearl, but it does a great service to some people who need that attention. Well, what an honor to have you on this film. And certainly it's just incredible how you stole every scene just with an expression on your face. I mean, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but really like you just, you Thank nailed you. it. It was really moving to see. It's something that we can all learn from. Thank you. Honey. Thank you so much. And Sheree, my love, how do you yes. find that your character had a lot of parallels with growing up in Iran? And, and how did you capture that into the role that you played as Bano? Well, as a matter of fact, I was very familiar with the uh, story when I was offered the role. I couldn't wait for Sergio to finish telling me what the story was about, to tell him that I'd love to jump on board with him and with beautiful Anna, Taurus, and all the good people and uh, bring it bring it to the silver screen, bring the story to the silver screen because of the fact that I had gone through this with my own father. Wow. I too lost my father to Alzheimer 12 years ago. Two years prior to that, we had a reunion. On the first day, he was almost, he looked lost. He was almost lost. He couldn't remember our names. He would politely ask us to introduce ourselves. And the second day, my brother, who's a doctor and in love with Persian music, he started playing an old Persian song and asked me to join him in dancing for Baba. The moment we started dancing, all of a sudden my father came to life and started calling us, each and every one of us, by our names. Wow. He was, uh, it was, Incredible. My mother was crying, literally, uh, thanking us for doing this so he could talk to my father, she could talk to my father, and she can run a conversation with him. In other words, 
So it's like, I was waiting for this moment that he would remember me and I, I could tell him a thousand times how much I love him. So I had seen the effect of music on this disease, the Alzheimer. My only regret is that I didn't learn from it. I didn't look at it from a scientific point of view. I thought, okay, this, this happened with us. But when I read, um, uh, Sergio told me the story and I read the script, which was elaborately, uh, you know, talked about what happens to this uh, man from, from Cuba, this musician. I was like, yes, this is it, exactly. Yes, I went through this. And I have to, you know, sometimes when, as an, not, not just as an actor, but as a human being, when you have an experience that could be beneficial, you know, putting it out, talking about it, could be beneficial to, to others, that you feel obliged to share it with others. I was like, the moment it uh, came, like we made the movie, I got back here, I was giving an interview and they were asking me about what I did and I briefly talked about the Cuban and told uh, the viewers, the Farsi speaking viewers, that if you do, by any chance, if you do have any uh, patient at home with the Alzheimer, this is, this is one of the ways, for God's sake, so just, you know, let him listen to the music that he was used to and eat the food that he used to eat before. Let him, let him feel at home. Let him feel sort of uh, content. Well, so, you know, you mentioned that you didn't learn anything through the process when you were going through it yourself, but how wonderful that you have educated so many people now who are tuning in and how really are looking at Alzheimer's with a different lens. Mm. Too great. That's um, wonderful. This movie is... One of the badge of honors that I carry, honestly. Oh, is oh. When I left Iran, I decided that I would, I'm, that I am an actress with a mission. And the mission was giving birth to, to stories or telling stories that would be profound and meaningful. And somewhat, uh, you know, in, at, the, at the service of the people. So this is one of the, you can imagine how happy, how proud I am. I cannot thank Anna Goya, our star, who not only did an amazing job in portraying this young girl from, from Afghanistan, but also on the uh, producing part. She, didn't, she was everywhere. She did everything for this film to be made. I cannot thank Taras enough. For, for supporting us so much. He was there every day. I cannot thank you, you know, yourself to, to uh, be there for us. Alessandra, for such an amazing story. And Sergio, of course, for bringing it to the cinema screen. So the dream come true. Thank you. Thank you. Dream, so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Anna, let's turn it to you. Uh, we were on a location scout together when we happened to walk upon the Sanderson Center and I noticed a very passionate look on your face and you seemed a little emotional. Perhaps you can share what that experience was like. Yeah, um, so I grew up dancing competitively and uh, you know, I was, I was traveling all over North America uh, competing and I when I was, it was one of my very first dance competitions when I was seven years old that I competed at the Sanderson Center. So when you were walking past it, I was like in, in almost disbelief because I had not seen it since I was a child. And I was like, oh my God, I have so many fond memories of this beautiful theater. And obviously as soon as we, as soon as we got in there, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I just, I got so many flashbacks and I was like dancing on stage. I felt like I was seven years old again. It was, uh, it was very nostalgic. And so for us to then be, be filming there, filming this, this incredible film, um, you know, it, it was, it meant a lot. It was a really memorable moment for me. Well, you could tell, and how proud are we of you that you've come back only a few short years later as an actress, a producer, a, a, a musician. I mean, seriously, that's like incredible. So certainly we can understand uh, where the emotions came from and we're so happy that we were able to have you experience that back in Brantford. Oh, it was such a pleasure being back and such a pleasure experiencing 
the incredible community that that you have there in Brantford and in, in the county of Brant. Um, you guys really welcomed us with with open arms and you were so warm and hospitable and we really can't thank everyone enough for for the part that they that they played in the making of this film. Well, thanks. You guys made it easy with your integrity and, and your passion for the project. So Jacko, my friend, I want to turn to you and uh, talk about the experience that you had where you and Anna so graciously shared with us uh, the time that you actually went to visit people in our hospice and help to fulfill their bucket list. It was really quite incredible. And I have to say, I know that it was a very late shoot to the night before. I think it was like two in the morning and you still both uh, showed up at the hospice and it meant the world to our our, our, our patients, our families, our volunteers, um, the staff there that you took the time and that you cared uh, to help fulfill that, that visit. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, there's, um, there's a very distinct feeling when you enter certain spaces that are very special. And, you know, Anna even mentioned the theater, you know, of, you know, reliving those moments, you know, and, um, as soon as you entered that building, I don't want to speak for Anna, but th there was a there was a distinct emotional response when I entered um, that building, and then it continued in meeting the staff and the patients, and um, you know, it's a it's a very dire uh, situation, and the families that are there are are going through incredibly difficult times, having to make difficult decisions, and um, I just feel really honored that I was able to go there as a guest and just be a witness to the work that was happening. Um, you know, a lot of times for movies, you, you do research, right? You, you prepare for these roles. You prepare not just for, you know, your character, but you prepare in, in, from an educational sense of the subject matter that, that you're doing. And this was very much a part of the subject matter of, of, of our film. Uh, and so, um, you know, Lou mentioned that I think it was before we went, but we were sort of in this Zoom call before it went live. But you know, as we're mentioning that, you know, um, it's it's a love letter to our elder community, and and so I feel like that space is a love letter to the elder community, and and so I, I'm I'm happy that the film highlights that highlights those elders and also the people that care for them uh, when they're in that time. So uh, yeah, I just felt very honored to be to to witness that place. Well, thank you. That's a beautiful way to put it, a love letter to the community. You know, one of the patients that you visited, I think I shared this with you and Anna, um, one of his bucket lists before he died was to have sort of his 15 minutes of fame. And uh, the local paper, the Brantford Expositor, ended up covering the story and posted that picture. And I'm going to get teary because I still get emotional with this. And uh, he just was so moved that uh, right before he died, he was able to fulfill that bucket list, bucket list and you and Anna made that happen. And how was that for you, honey? Because I know that it was it was very emotional. Um, emotional would be uh, an understatement. Every time, I, from the first moment that I walked into that building, that very first day, um, you, as Giacomo said, you immediately feel that energy, and and it's not even it's not, you know, it's not that painful like drained kind of energy. It's 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 a beautiful warm caring uh energy and and it was so overwhelmingly beautiful that every time literally every time I walked into that building I I was like all, on the verge of tears seeing the wall of butterfly uh butterflies you know brought me to tears the amount of thought that went into every single element of that space was just so um so heartbreakingly beautiful and um to, to mirror Jack Moe's sentiments. Like I was just so honored that I was able to be there uh, and sharing some of these final moments in, in these people's lives. Um, it was, uh, it was, you know, something that you, you, you can't even describe. So thank you for, for allowing us to, to partake in those moments. Uh, I can't tell you what it meant to the patients and the families that all came and the staff and the volunteers. They're amazing to be taking on all these challenges, particularly in light of COVID and the additional stress that they have already on their burdened uh, journey in the profession that they've chosen. So I have to tell you, it was just a real honor to have you both there and they still talk about it. So it really, it really meant a lot. Thank you very much. 
Um, speaking of COVID, Sergio, I want to turn to you and ask sort of how we have you have pivoted uh, as a result of COVID and really made some dramatic changes to the format of what we had originally hoped and even the premiere tonight and, and sort of how you and the team have coped with that. Well, you know, I'm not going to lie. Um, initially, it was um, it was a huge disappointment because you have a certain vision in your head. You shoot a movie for the big screen. The shots are set up that way. The camera you use is conducive to seeing it on the big screen. And um, but it didn't take long before we got busy and got into meetings and tried to figure out ways, safe ways to get it to the communities. And our first idea was the drive-in experience because people can stay in their own bubble and um you know there's there's <laughs> there's pros and cons to everything right so the thing i missed was the um initial you know visceral reaction to people uh you know crying laughing at, at different scenes and then at the end clapping so now it's like dead silent and then everyone honks at the end so it's a different yeah. way of experiencing it um and then in the u.s we were able to to touch so many more people because um, we were able to open in 52 theaters across the U.S., which probably would have never happened pre-COVID. And, um, and uh, so it was all those things that kind of gave us opportunities, including Zoom calls, like, you know, cast being in different places all over North America and being able to connect through this medium. It's just a new way and we embrace it. Uh, I started on 35 millimeter film. Those days are over. So now we shoot a different way, but storytelling is storytelling. And ultimately we want to see our stories experienced by audiences. And I think we, we had the, the gift of, of that more than, I mean, I think it exceeded our expectations uh, given the circumstances and around the pandemic. So lots well, of- Well, good for you. Yeah, good for you. It's a very trying time for sure. And I think uh, in a sense, it almost- allowed people an opportunity to join in with their families, particularly at their driving experience and sort of relive their youth and actually, you know, enjoy that experience. And I, I almost wonder right. if more people had an opportunity to see it through the pivot that you made. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the driving was uh, certainly, we were all cooped up in our homes for, for months. And then um, it was cathartic to see everybody out is very emotional. And uh, you know, at our first event in Toronto, it was uh larger than life and um yeah it was it was quite a thrill I mean we were all you know wearing these things uh, yes. um so all our pictures look like this uh but that's okay I mean you know it's we wear underwear we wear pants so now we wear masks as long as you know it's for the the, the greater good and uh we'll get through this like we've gotten through other challenges so um yeah I can't wait to see what the history books are going to say. Like, you know, Luca's generation, you know, they're going to come home and say, guess what? We're talking about the year 2020 <laughs> and we're all going to cringe in horror, like just remembering, yeah. you know, some of the challenges, but also some of the wonderful things that have come from it too, like, like this and just reconnecting again with friends and family in a different and maybe more meaningful way. 100%. So true, yeah. <laughs> So I'd like to give a shout out to the incredible um, Hilario Duran, who's a Cuban Canadian Grammy nominated Juno award winning uh, artist who put together the music score, which is just fantastic. If you haven't had a chance to download it yet on, on various platforms, please do. I'm constantly, you know, um, grooving around the house uh, to the soundtrack. And, and Lou, I turn to you um, with regards to the music, because I know that you had an interesting connection um, with music in your youth and, and how that inspired you. Can you share a little bit about that with us? Well, there was a fashion in, in high school back in the 50s where we had the contests. And our favorite uh, musicians was... Uh, Can you step up a little bit, Lou? We can't hear you. I want to make sure Machito. we hear. I know this is important. Our stars were Machito and Tito Puente and Tito Rodriguez and Joe Cuba. We had contests and our, and our, our, our dances were all Afro-Cuban. That was introduced to us by the great Disney Gillespie. That was one connection. And so it was able to go back to do the cha-cha-cha and the merengue and all that kind of stuff. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, yeah. Okay, so then the other connections, I wanted to see if you can see this on screen or not. But if you can see a picture of me and that old lady there. That's my great-grandmother when I first started in show business, I was 17. And in that photograph, she was more or less 115. So we were raised by the elders of our family. So the old African culture started and continued on in slavery by the elders, some of them had Alzheimer's, didn't know how old they were, but when she died, she was approximately 117. 
So think about those moments that uh, she she laid in me and my cousin's life. It was uh, some someone was very funny, you know, because people were talking about how old uh, she was. She said, "You keep talking about how old you are. I'm at least ten years older than every one of you." And thank goodness, who is it? <laughs> 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 but it was, it, was left, it was left time, but that's what you would, I'm getting, I'm about 50% there right now, because I'm in my 80s now. <laughs> to celebrate, get to celebrate that feeling. It's a joy to celebrate. Some things I don't know, but I still have a conscious contact with the elders who taught me up until now who I really am. Because very basic, very sensitive to the elder. It's a pleasure to do this character and to salute them when they took me to that uh, home in Canada. All those people need that attention. They have a lot of stories to tell us. And I think them. you did an amazing job depicting that, Lou, and, and really instilling that in all of us, that we all have stories to tell. Absolutely. And back to you, Taraz, and sort of the inspiration of the movie that I think yeah. the Cubans so eloquently explained that and maybe inspired us all to go back to, you know, our grandparents and family and really sort of chat with them and, and hear their stories and talk about yeah. some of the challenges that they overcame. They have some missing stories that we need to hear about. Really yeah. nice. A lot of and stuff. Congratulations for inspiring people to do that. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Anna, uh, going back to you, honey, um, it was just incredible for you to not only be your first time producing a movie, also to be the lead actress. And as, on top of that, of, as if that's not enough, to be performing with some songs and then certainly continuing to perform at various venues throughout uh, various functions that were held at the drive-ins. How did you cope with all that? It's amazing. You're such a young talent and uh, you're certainly wise beyond your years and we're all very proud of you and how you accomplished that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, honestly, uh, you know, Lou says this all the time. When you do what you love, you don't work a day in your life. So Absolutely. for me, it, uh, it was just nonstop fun. It was the craziest period of my life. It was the craziest four and a half years of my life. Absolutely. But I wouldn't trade a, a moment of it for, for anything. Um, you know, I was really, really lucky to have such an incredible team behind me. When Sergio and I were busy fulfilling our other roles, uh, Taras and, and Alessandra and the rest of the team were we're taking the reins on the day-to-day -day producing uh, duties. So we were able to kind of switch hats. We'd be debriefed in the morning and debriefed in the, at the end of the day. And, you know, you do what you have to do. But um, yeah, it, it really, it was a team effort. It, it really takes a village. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations. You certainly saw your passion shine through. And I loved so many scenes throughout the movie and, uh, you know, it, was, it could tell you having fun while you're doing it. We were having a lot of fun. We yeah, still yeah. talk about it. We're like, can we go back? Can we reshoot it? Can we make a sequel? <laughs> exactly. Will there be the a sequel? Time. That's a good question. Will there be a sequel, Sergio? <laughs> well, absolutely, hundred percent. That's what yeah. I look for: is sequels. <laughs> so I want to get it committed. There's a sequel. Will you come back to Brantford? Actually, film, four years is not very long. They've, they've broke some, some, some records there. Four years is about the right time. If, if That's not right. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. a miracle. It really is. Four it's years is the right time when everything falls into place. Isn't Absolutely. It? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right people came into the picture at the right time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There were challenges. I'm, I won't say there weren't. But I, no, I mean, there are absolutely. But Working you know, in a bank, there's challenges. Yeah. So I'd rather yeah. do this. <laughs> it, it was just incredible. It was the the first project I'd ever been involved in where I felt like I had to run to catch up to it. That it was it was going at such a pace that we were all sort of chasing it rather than you know the other way around. And it was an incredible experience. It was almost like the film just wanted to be made. <laughs> So. And a lot of a lot of strange, a lot of strange coincidences too. I mean, yeah, we don't yeah. have all things. There's no such thing as coincidence, Sergio. Yeah, right. it was meant to be, right? Yeah, it was really meant to be. Sure, so, I want to look to you. I Sorry, I'm turning to you now. Trust me, stories that want to be told find their way out. It's Absolutely. unbelievable. That's I've it. Been, I've been working on a project for almost four years now. 
and it's not happening. The, the moment is going to happen, something drastic happens, like we lose the producer or we lose the director. It's incredible. But the story is that has to be, have to be told and want to be told, which we hear them. We, we make them, they come out somehow, one way or the other. It really no, happened with the Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Remember that film? Yeah. It wasn't was supposed to have been made. It had such a charm. Yeah, yeah. The music, everything, was just fit, just like this one. Yeah. That's like this one. It's got a charm. It's going to be made whether you like it or not. And it becomes something that everybody loves. Yeah, exactly. Everybody, yeah. You're right, Lou. There's no such thing as coincidences. Thing happen, things happen for a reason, yeah. right? Yeah, but at the right time. Yes. So, so Troy, I want to I want to change uh, the tone a little bit, and and I sort of have a question to ask you about what was your first acting job, and what really pulled you towards the opportunity <laughs> to tell these stories and to engage the community and engage the world in these beautiful uh, uh, stories that you talk about. Uh, well, my wow, my first <laughs> it is forty eight years ago. <laughs> my first acting job was at the theater. Uh, in a play called The Narrow Road to the Deep North by Edward Bond, in which I portrayed a British queen who's running away from a couple of samurais who are trying to kill her and throw her out of their country. So it was, it was oh my God, it was, it was an amazing, amazing play. The director was British. She came all the way to Iran from, from the UK to do this play in Farsi. And we were almost lost in translation, but the outcome, the result was perfect. Thousands of Iranians came to watch the play and uh, it, was, it was Edward Bond that made me think responsible, be responsible. And then when I started, uh, uh, one by one, uh, like the more meaningful, the more profound, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the screenplay was, or the script was, or the play was, it would have, you know, I would have felt like ch a challenging situation. This is a challenging situation. But the, uh, the, the one that made me, finally, to just concentrate, concentrate on meaningful stuff was the revolution in Iran. When I left, I felt like, wait a second, they don't have so many people like myself out. Mm -hmm. you know, in the Western world, to talk for them, to become their voice. Uh, so therefore I have to be careful in what I accept to do and what not, and the roles that I'm going to play and so on and so forth. It's been 40 years now. That's okay. amazing, my friend. And it's incredible too, your passion to your fans. I've been with you enough occasions to see just the loyalty and the commitment and the love that you have for people that support your work. It's truly fascinating. Olga, just a quick anecdotal story. When I met Shoray 10 years ago at, uh, it was at a film festival. And after the screening, she said, or it was a screening or an event. She said, let's, let's go for drinks. Or I don't know, we were going somewhere and uh, Ben Kingsley was there to greet us and all that kind of stuff. But before getting in the car, these two big guys, comb the car and they're and they're looking and they say okay you're good to enter and i said what's going on she said oh they're just checking for bombs i said perfect this is <laughs> die for your art <laughs> i got to work with this lady <laughs> i want to day in the life wow. that's how it works with me it's intense so, yeah we went, i went to lunch honey uh honey hunter uh oscar and, 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 and nominees uh, Holly invited us all for lunch so it was uh, there was Marcia uh, Gay Harlan Patricia Clarkson Clarkson one of my favorite actors of all time Holly, uh, Holly Hunter so uh, I went to, the, to her hotel I went to the room she opened the door and by pure chance there were two guys huge guys just walking there and she looked at me and she said did you bring your bodyguards with you and I said no these are not with me I'm on my own <laughs> what? What? Like someone who just walks with her bodyguards wherever she goes, she takes. Them. <laughs> but but yes, when when it comes to the public, yes, I'm I'm afraid I have to be careful. If you recall, my last film was the last one that was shown in the Toronto Film Festival had to be uh, 
pull down because of uh, a bomb jet that it received. So that's fine. But it made a difference. Stony of Soraya that's made right. a difference politically yeah. in certain places in the world. And that's when a film can do that, it's incredible. Absolutely. Um, speaking of other films, Giacomo, I want to turn to you. Uh, in addition to the role that you played uh, so beautifully tonight in The Cuban, I know that you've been busy filming, I believe season 17, we said, of Grey's Anatomy as uh, Dr. DeLuca. And you also uh, dabbled into the film world as well through your movie Acquainted. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, uh, I executive produced and starred in a film uh, a couple of years ago that's just now starting to get a release in the US uh, on December 8th called Acquainted. Uh, that's sort of like a romantic uh, drama film. And uh, just excited to share it with you guys. A little too realistic though, man. <laughs> it really it really captures the the essence of uh modern relationships it was yeah it was really heartbreaking at moments but also very charming beautiful yeah we felt like we wanted to make a movie that sort of showed what it was like for 30 something year olds today dating and um and now i mean god the, the dating scene with with covid has changed how people are supposed to meet and talk through apps and afraid to meet their dates and you know, how far do we sit from each other? It's, it's really changed um, uh, how we do dating and then relationships uh, at all. So, um, so yeah, um, I think it'll be a nice, I think, you know, the pandemic has had everybody at home and wanting this, you know, excess of movies and things to watch to sort of pass the time to, to heal our souls and to distract us maybe even from, from what's going on. And so, um, Luckily, there's uh, more than enough creative people here making things that we can all watch and enjoy. That's a really good point, Giacomo. It's interesting how the entertainment industry has really risen to this level now during the time of pandemic and how it's brought such an escape uh, and so much joy and passion to people's lives. I couldn't imagine, you know, my life without all the streaming devices at home with my family. Of course. It's great. Alessandra, back to you, and I uh, just want to get back to touching on sort of the spotlight that the movie uh, was able to shine on Alzheimer's and the work that you did and the research, particularly in, in, in Alzheimer's and the connections that you've had since then, because you've really ignited that passion in a lot of people to sort of share those stories and re-examine their loved ones. And, and I have a sense that people all across North America now, after seeing the movie, are are really trying to incorporate music in their loved ones' uh, lives that have some form of dementia. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, um, I. It's funny you were talking about the research and writing the script and everything, and and I. Uh, it made me think about the actual process of writing the script. And I have to say, I did most of the research after I had already written the first draft. And what I was using the research for was basically confirming what I had kind of intuitively put together through experience. And um, so, and, and it's really interesting that people can have that sort of relationship with someone with um, a condition like Alzheimer's or a different type of dementia where um, you can really be in the moment with someone who uh, you realize when somebody doesn't remember things that the moments are really what matters. And then through having that experience with that person, you also begin to recognize that that's really what matters anyway. It's not all your worries and all your cares and all the people that did whatever they did yesterday, right? Um, it's, it's that moment that you share with someone right then and there. So um, one thing I hope that the movie is able to do is to help people really um, appreciate that connection a little bit more and to look for different ways to create those connections with each other. And I know in the hospice situation, it was all about the moments, wasn't it? Like, I'm sure that you have a lot of experience with that as well. Well, and that's beautiful. And I think you accomplished that incredibly well. And it's a good reminder for all of us. There's also a silver lining. There was one patient that I had met that was completely catatonic. He was uh, a musician and an artist. And um, when his wife would play music to him, I was just sitting in the corner, just being witness to it because in order to pretend it on screen, I needed to see it at least once because we had seen videos and 
but mm -hmm. I wanted to witness it my, for myself. I wanted to see somebody come to life. And um, he came to life as she read him poetry and uh, was singing to him. It was so beautiful and so tender. And I said, you know, you must have had an incredible relationship. And, uh, and she says, no, not really. She said, actually, the, the dementia has stripped away all his angst, all his anxiety, um, all his frustration with life, and distilled it down to his essence. So like what, what I was witnessing is the purity of, of the person, right? The soul. And uh, it was very beautiful to see that. So, you know, as, as tragic as Alzheimer's is, I think it's in some ways more tragic for the caregivers and the people around than it is for the actual person uh, dealing with the disease itself. So that's amazing. You touch on a really good point because even in the character uh, in the Cuban, you know, we don't know how the character lived within his mind and what his belief were, was. And there's lots of different theories of what he thought his relationship was or wasn't. And uh, I think it was really brilliant how you sort of left it up to the imagination of the viewer to really determine whether it was real or not, whether he thought it was real. And uh, it was sort of a beautiful glimpse into what the mind of someone perhaps with dementia or Alzheimer's uh, would incorporate. How did you find that, Lou? Well, they kind of pick, you kind of pick up where you left off. You know, it closes, the door closes until something it gives you some, some kind of impetus to pick up where you left off. So what she did to me is I remember the last time I tasted that good Cuban food, the last time I, I heard that good music, and the last time I was in love. So those are things that had closed down and went to sleep that she instilled back in my system. I picked up where I left off. So, so then there's the area of, of unreality when he was dancing with the woman he loved and turned out to be her. And then all of a sudden he came back to his reality. You pick up where you left off. That's what I understand with Alzheimer's. You just go to sleep a little bit and then something stimulates you and you pick up where you leave, left off. It could be 20 years ago, but you pick up where you left off. That's a good way to look at it. I mean, really, what is the reality, right? Is yeah, the reality yeah. what That's the world enough. is experiencing or what you feel is inside why, your mind? Why does it get up? I'm, I'm having that feeling right now. What year is this? Is <laughs> <laughs> no one knows. You don't want to know. know. <laughs> is, is, is this still 2016? Yeah. Yeah. We wish. Yeah. Year zero. It's, plus. <laughs> it's a reset for sure. Yeah. Year zero. Exactly. So for those that were able, unfortunately, to miss the presentation tonight and really want an opportunity to see the movie. Uh, this will live stream will be recorded and it'll be shared on social media. So hopefully it'll inspire people to check that out. Um, Taras, I'm going to turn to you and ask uh, what the exciting news is about the, the release plans that you have coming up across Canada. The film is going to be out on video on demand on November 6th, all mm -hmm. across Canada. Right hey. up. <laughs> hey, so for the hashtag boomers, you know, kind of like uh, me, like what exactly does that mean? I <laughs> want people to understand what it means, how they could access it, like give us a bit more information. Uh, my God, it's going to be everywhere. A Vimeo, it's Apple TV, Amazon, Apple, Google. <laughs> Take it away, Anna. <laughs> Super Channel. Amazon, yeah, all the things. Super Channel. <laughs> worldwide. Which one is worldwide? Like people everywhere can watch. Amazon and Apple, I guess, and are the ones Microsoft that are across North America. Hmm? Okay, North America. What yeah, so if they have a subscription to that, they're able to tune in, or is it like a, a pay-per-view kind of thing? This is a pay -per -view. video on demand, so it's, yeah, it's a pay-per-view. So, yep. but it's, it's, it'll be available on every platform except for Sony PlayStation. So, mm. we've got it. Coming. Okay, well, that's good to know. Sony. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for plugging. Sony. Not for our gamers. <laughs> great, great plug for Sony. Exactly. Except for <laughs> Sony PlayStation. <laughs> Oh well, my gosh, our time has just gone by so quickly. Um, this was really moving for me, having this beautiful little reunion with so many talented people. I'm so honored that you were able to join us and grace us with your presence, um, really as a tribute as well to Brantford and the County of Brant and where it all happened. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for your passion, for the work that you do that's so important during this time, not just through COVID, but just through our lives. And, and as you all mentioned, how you've really uh, inspired a lot of people and touched us through your story. So keep on with the storytelling. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I'd also like to thank the city of Brantford for hosting this wonderful event. 
Uh, and I'd like to thank in particular the Department of Economic Development and Tourism. Um, they've been amazing. Yes, let's give them a clap for sure. They've been fantastic um, organizing this and hopefully it will be seen by a lot of people. Uh, and just thank you again to all of you for participating. Any any final words? Did I miss anything? Asking you anything that you'd like to participate yeah, before we move on? Tars and Dan. <laughs> Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Yes, part two, right? Like yes, we've yes. committed that, Sergio. Like you're all on record now. This is on video, so I mean, there's really not much that. Uh -oh. uh... As long as, as long as I get the Kubrick room at the Arlington Hotel, uh, there you go. It's the, the they are all set. The axe yeah. in the door just for me was everything. It inspired me every morning at five a.m. and terrified. One, one me. bottle of maple syrup. <laughs> I, I need to get Zoom the Jane Austen room. We could have a whole Zoom, Zoom call Zoom. on that hotel. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, Sergio, in your words that you repeated, I don't know, a couple hundred times, let's make a movie during this night. You yes. did it. So congratulations to all. Cheers to all of you. Cheers to Brian. Cheers. Brand Cheers. Brand. Cheers. Um, Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. And here's to the sequel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, so you. So Thank, you. Thank, Thank you, County of Thank Brand. you, everyone. Thank you, Olga. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. to see everybody. See ya. Woohoo! <laughs>